Well, I want to be like entertaining slash informative for you guys and like have a entertaining like little session here. So it's not going to be me just like talking at you. I'd like you to share some stories, ask some questions, like have a conversation. This it's so um, it's so incredible to get to share this floor with you all. This craft to me is it's that it's a craft. It's an art. It's there's a sign. There's a level of science to it, right? But more so an art of how you touch people's lives, of how you get to understand what's on their heart first and their head second, and and how you use those things to motivate them. And when we go and we have, I had a Q and A in Harrisburg on Monday. I wasn't. That's why I wasn't here all day Monday. I was in Harrisburg doing a site visit. Well, um, we did a Q and A afterwards that was similar to this, and it's just incredible, you guys, to hear. <laughs> how much this brand is changing the lives of the people in Harrisburg and in all your locations respectively, but they don't talk about fitness ever. It's not like, not one word in an hour and a half was about fitness, right? And it just, I think it says something very powerful when I believe, and I know that you believe, or else I don't believe you would be here, that our product is bar none the best. Like we're not just competing in that realm or dominating in that realm. I don't have, it's not my opinion anymore. I was out in Salt Lake City. We're shutting down all the F-45s next to us. Not that that was our goal. I'm not into that game, but we were just doing our thing and we were providing value the Burn Bootcamp way and uh, members just started flocking to us in those areas. And even when members come from other different gyms and they come to us, it's like, man, I'm in better shape in 30 days than I was in, you know, in like six months, two years, three years, that's somewhere else. And it's just a testament to your hard work, right? And the hard work that, you know, I get it. I'll take credit for like the origination of it and setting forth that standard and that work ethic. I've trained over 15,000 camps. I did 42 a week for the first, I don't know, six years. And then, and then transitioned from like 25 down to 10, down to zero over the next. So I was training eight years and um, probably averaged 30, you know, 30 camps a week for those eight years. And, and uh, it was the hardest thing ever for me to step back and to say give up. That's what it felt like, is like give up my, uh, my members to um, Matt Morris, some guy named Matt, I don't know this guy, right? But that's when I stepped back full time, you know, I, it took me hiring my best friend from childhood who I've known since we were this big, it took that level of trust in order for me to hand my baby off to, to, uh, to somebody else. And, and by doing that, you know, it really opened up possibilities for me. And hopefully, I, hopefully you see that trend or that trajectory. And I know some of you have been around for a very long time. And hopefully you see that and you get to see an example of how you can create not only, not only impact, right, but my goal is to create this brand for trainers so that we could wear one jersey, have one philosophy, not have to bounce around to every, you know, uh, boutique or personal training shop or box gym or go do freaking yoga at the Ritz Carlton to make our ends meet, you know, because when I came into the industry in 2012, that's what everybody was doing. Like this whole ideology of being able to make money as a trainer wasn't really that impressive to a lot of folks, right? Who felt that way before in their past careers? Anybody of that old? Yeah. And we would just kind of bounce around and much time is wasted in between different methodologies and like now you're conflicted because you know you have all these different methodologies that you have to uphold because you're an employee of these different brands and just was uh, not a very good environment for people who felt like we do about the craft of training uh, and, and so what we wanted to do is create something different. Create a, an environment where we could challenge ourselves, where that void, uh, was there anybody, uh, let me ask a, this a question, this day. was there anybody that wasn't part of a team culture, a sports, chess club, any, anything, like debate, like any, was there anybody that wasn't a part of a team growing up, high school, college? Yeah, usually, okay, no, that's good. I'm sure you were part of something, were you ever a dancer, were you ever, did you do anything with the team? If you think back? Okay, perfect. Did you feel a part of the team? Did you have camaraderie? Were those people around you? Yeah, yeah, so you, you've got some glimpse of, of that and and for those, if we've gotten really deep into that, like I played professional sports, I was so deep into it to where when I left professional sports, my hole in my heart was like this big around. And I, I'm not a depressive person, but that's the closest I've ever been. And I was just very anxious, uncertain of the future. And I hated those feelings, but I love this craft. And so, you know, I think part of 
this, what you see today and why you guys are all attracted to the brand is because it does that for you in some way. It fills your void, it gives you your team, it gives you your purpose, it gives you your meaning. And the bigger the meaning is in our life, the more responsibility we take, the more purpose we have. And the more purpose we have, um, the harder it is, the harder it is, the more challenge we have, the more challenge we overcome, the more confident we get. And life is all about the skill of confidence, in my opinion, which I think is a skill, not something that you naturally just inherit. You can see that in your members, right? How many members do we have that have just like 180 flipped their confidence and now they're just in a completely different, a completely different person. They've learned the skill of acquiring confidence. And so that's what I wanna talk about. I wanna hear maybe some of your stories. You guys can ask questions. I wanna um, really continue to hear what's on your head and your heart about how do we get better as a brand if there's suggestions that you have. And yeah, let's just have like an open, an open conversation. Uh, was there, I'm gonna throw you this if you raise your hand. Does anybody wanna start? There you go, good job. What? Yeah, I'm <laughs> impressed with myself that I got that. Nice catch, Sam. Am I just gonna hold it like yeah, this? Yeah, you can hold it. Hey, we have, we're, how do we get over that? Oh, we're on there, we're coming on that speaker. Here, oh, I can. Okay, You've, that's oh, good. You can hear me, so I'm just gonna hold it, okay. Yeah. Um, you don't have to hold it that close either. Oh, okay. There you go, just like normal, okay. just casual. Okay. Like okay. what just I do casual. with my hands. Okay. <laughs> just keep your hands by your side, Ricky Bobby. What do you, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but okay. You got it, Sam. What what do you what would you like me to say, Devin? I just want you to, to share your story. You've been here for a long time. I have been here for a long time. So, so give us a little bit. My um my FP before Burn really ex sort of existed. She had her own boot camp down in uh, Florida, female only boot camp. I was her client there, um, and she's like, I'm gonna go do this thing and open up this new gym, and I said, Well, I'm gonna follow you. Sure, cool. That sounds good. That was September of 2015, first burn in Florida opened. And I was a member for all of four months before I started training. She's like, you need to be on the floor. Never something I thought I would do. I, I don't like being the center of attention. I don't like everyone staring at me. Um, and here we are, here we are eight years later. I hate it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I was a support trainer for a while. I worked as a BA, uh, moved to Michigan um, for two years for my husband's job. Luckily, they had a burn there, so I worked um, in Grand Rapids two years as their basically lead trainer, um, and COVID happened, and I was like, we're not staying in Michigan. Let's move back home, and I called Holly, and I said, hey, you got a job for me? I will make a job for you, and it worked out, and here I am, lead trainer after three years. So Holly, yeah. so I worked at Lifestyle Family Fitness. That was my first training job, and I was one-on-one -on -one trainer. And I heard about this amazingly talented, super fit blonde girl from across the way. She was from Vanderbilt and 41, and I was like from Golden Gate, Livingston. Those are like two main intersections. She was at the other Lifestyle Family Fitness. And her, her name was Holly Boot. Like, how unfair is that? <laughs> she had built in her name. I was like, you, that's a stage name, you liar. <laughs> She's like, nope, it's Holly Boot. And it's like, Holly Boot Camp, that is just like an incredible name. And so she was, she was doing um, Holly's, uh, what was it called at the Beach time? Body Beach with Body Holly with Holly. Holly. Mm -hmm. And she was doing it inside of a lifestyle family fitness. And so Holly gave me the first original idea uh, to do a business within a business. And then I created this same thing that she was doing only in my gym called Lightning 900. And if you guys have heard any of my story before, you know that's like the first rendition of Burn. Well, Holly and I became very good friends. Like it was a fun, friendly competition, right? I still wanted to kick her ass and she wanted to kick my ass, don't get me wrong, we're very competitive. But we were conspiring together, right? And, and we really, Holly and I, um, are the, I would say the nucleus of what the training, what training is today at Burn Boot Camp. And then Morgan got a promotion up to Charlotte for Kellogg's at the time. And that was Sugar Mama and she had supported me my whole life, so I'm going. You know, I'm, yeah. um, there's no, no, not a question. I was doing well too. And, um, and so I was leaving and I was like, Holly, you know, I'm gonna go start my own gym. And if it takes off, like I think it's going to, like let's do something together still. Cause we were already talking about doing something together in Naples at the time if I were to stay. And so I left and then three years later, pretty much came back and was like, hey, I've got this whole thing. Like check out the, check out the results. We kept in touch and 
she was in right away. And you know, her husband, Justin, who's a dear friend of mine now, super skeptical about me at first. He was like, who's this guy? He's yeah. just like, who's this dude? Like, no, you're not gonna partner with some guy. What brand? There's a brand? He's in a parking lot, Holly, seriously. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and well, she convinced him and now, you know, together they run Naples with Sam uh, as uh, your co-lead there. Lead. Lead, lead there. Mm -hmm. um, forgive me for not knowing. I, okay. I wasn't sure if Holly still wanted the mark. Um, but yeah, now Sam's leading the way there, and that's our, you guys might beat like Norman this year. We're still ahead right now, but the, if not second, the number one gym in the country in terms of revenue. So it's, 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 it's Lake Norman, isn't that crazy? It's Lake Norman and Naples, and it kind of start. those are the two biggest gyms, and it kind of started with me and Holly. And so I just always like that story and appreciate you, Sam, for being here, and Holly couldn't do it without you. Like you're such a, a large part of that, and, you know, in all of your gyms, you guys, I mean, we're the staple, right? Like, we're like the, we're like the, we're like the leaders of the leadership factory. Like, if you think about, like, our members come in here, and when they come out, <laughs> they come in without confidence, so they come out being leaders of their family, and, or their, or their community, or their PTA, or whatever is important to them in their life, and, you know, I feel like as a trainer, you know, we add that hat means much more than it's given credit for in the past couple decades, and, uh, you know, People like Holly, Sam, you all, we set out to change that. So thanks for sharing your story and You're let welcome. me elaborate on it. Yep. Anybody else want to share? Come on, y'all. Listen, if I said, okay, let me see who I, I want to be an author. So if I sat down next to J.K. Rowling, I'm not going to shut up about asking that woman questions. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but like I grew, I've been here since day one. Nobody else has been here since day one. Be curious. Don't be shy. Um, so we talked about yesterday um, about going from three and three strength and cardio camps and going from four to two. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we fall in love with our members, not our own ideology that is subjective. So we did a survey and it was hands down, not even close. Mm -hmm. Members want three and three. It wasn't even close. It was oh. like 80, 20. Yeah. Um, so what that means is that 20% still would like to have some more strength. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that we should probably get with our members on a more personal level and really get to know who are the ones that need more strength, right? Because today, in my, and this, what was the protocol this morning? Metcon, today, my shoulders got hypertrophy because they put 35 pound weights in my hands and I was doing those little jump presses. I was barely jumping, but I was doing these presses kind of stagnant and I was fatigued here. I wasn't doing more than 15 reps. So you can manipulate Metcon days. There's a couple protocols where based on how you treat somebody, it, like in a strength day, for an example, you could take me to maximal strength training if you wanted to. You don't need to leave me in hypertrophy. You know, you know what I'm talking about, the OPT model, optimum performance training model in NASM, or you start with what's the first layer? Do we all know this? Yeah, what's the second? It's, 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 first, it's stability endurance, then stability strength, and then hypertrophy, and then maximal strength and then power and then performance training on top of that, which is disassociated. But that third one, hypertrophy, right? We don't get a lot of our members into maximal strength training. The definition of that is five to eight reps, right? We don't get a lot of members into that unless y'all are training me. And I'm like, I, my goal is to get, I want to maintain size and I want to get shredded. That's, I want to maintain size and get shredded. So you have to get me into that maximal strength training area, right? You got, you have to in order for me to adapt. Um, so four and two, three and three at face value, we'll stay three and three. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to you modifying members up and down off the baseline, yeah. this is where you get that creativity. I think about it a lot like Starbucks menu. You walk into any Starbucks, they got a menu, right? And like who actually orders something off the menu? Raise your hand if you actually order something off the menu. It's okay. Because I can't think of right? anything else. <laughs> yeah, you're the 20% that do the baseline of the workout, right? Who orders something that's like, they have to ask you again, like, what, what, do you, what was that? What was that? Right? You guys, you guys are the complex OGs that have been here for eight years that need to be asked again yeah. and again and again. What's, and who's like pretty quick and dirty order, but it is simple, but it's also not on the menu. That's the rest of us. Yeah. And then some of us don't even drink coffee or anything at all, right? <laughs> right? Ignite, just that, right? But my, my analogy says that the actual Starbucks put service, they put customer service in the limelight in a product-oriented business, which opened the, opened the floodgates 
to um, create community in a brick and mortar business model. That's what they did. They created community, right? By allowing their, what do they call them? No, yeah, yeah, baristas, yeah, and their patrons or, mem or um, guests. Yeah. They allow them to modify up and down off the baseline of their menu, yeah. right? And now they're known, they're well known for um, hyper, -lo like every Starbucks is, has a hyper local feel to it. You know it's a big company, but when you walk in and because you're, you bleed blue, you know, they pump two spirulinas into your, blue spirulina into your iced coffee and it turns it this blue color, right? They've customized that for you. And that's really where the creativity of the business as a whole comes in. And the creativity is what makes the brand work. That's what makes it work is that relationship in this, in that case, although they're serving coffee and helping people, you know, get a few extra hours of work in or something rather than transforming their life from the inside out. So there are differences, but what we get to do is just so much more powerful. And so you can be four and two on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis with your members, yeah. right? In a Metcon day, like, I could have went, I could have went probably here, front raise, I could have done shoulder, I could have put a pretty good hypertrophy based shoulder workout together for you if you were like, Metcon, too many reps, I don't want too many reps. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be that athletic, I want to gain size. Mm -hmm. I could, I could do that for you. Do you guys, does that make sense? Yeah. So I want to give you that creativity. Without that creativity, actually I don't want to give it to you. I have to give you that creativity. If I don't give it to you, you don't respect the brand as, and you don't, you don't bring your talents to this organization. You guys are the best of the best. You don't bring your talents here if you've got to stare at a screen. There's a reason that you're not staring at screens every day. Because you think that renders you useless as a, as a person of um, pride in their craft. And that's the way that I see it. So you can always expect that from me. We'll do the hard things. I'll fly to the regional trainings. If it's 10 people or 100, I don't care. And we'll sit down and we'll talk about how to get better. And if that one person out of the 14 left and went to another place the next day, well, great. We made them better that day. You know, and so that commitment to education and the commitment to people first and valuing them over the business, uh, to me, is ultimately what attracts you guys. And maybe I'm just putting it into some language that might make sense to you if it hasn't been put that way, but that's the way that I think about it, and that's how important you all are to this brand. It thrives or dies on the back of your ability to be creative and have those one-on-one -on -one relationships with your members. That's good. Yeah, great question. And by the way, I'll continue to survey. I got so much shit for putting a podcast out there where I was actually debating it in the open, but guess what? I don't care, yeah. because you ask for transparency, I'm gonna give it to you. You can't ask for transparency and then say, hold back your words. You can't have your cake and eat it too. That's not how the world works. So I'll put a survey out there. I'll talk about it. I never said we were going to. I said, I'm neutral. And I did that. I said, I'm neutral. I'm right in the middle. I fall in love with what the members want. And that's how we should move and shake, right? As all of us as trainers, remove our egos out of it. Because it's not about what we want. It's not about what music we like to play. It's not about what... Um, level of the five in the OPT model that we want to be at or we want to train at. It's about what they want and how can we add and serve their lives. And if we remember that, there's a level of humility that comes with that. And then we never have to feel like we're trying to be right. Like all of us collectively can do right. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yes. Um, my name is Ashley. Hi, Ashley. I'm from Jersey. Sweet. So, um, what location in Jersey? Springfield with Woo! Sandra. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Um, so I just, a little, I have two questions, but I want to also kind of go off of what you were saying about following a screen and everything. I, a little bit about my history is that I just left Orange Theory. I was, um, the head coach there for like a year and a half. Um, and then I found Burn back in January and I have to say that I feel like I have learned so much as a trainer from just working here compared to what I did previously because I'm able to be so creative and also be challenged as a member and challenged as a trainer every day. So I just wanted to let you know that like this challenges me in like the best way possible. So thank you for that. I'm but, so glad. Thank you for sharing that with mm -hmm. us. And I did not pay her to say that. She's not playing. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. But um, We're happy to have you. And I respect you. Orange Theory greatly. If I ever clown on them or anything, it's only out of respect. I think they've done mm -hmm. a great job. They made boutique fitness a thing. 
Yeah. Right? They did. Yeah. They did. I mean, and they, from an operational person, I think we dominate the fitness side and, and we're getting better and better and better and better and better operationally. And they do that really, really well. So catching them operationally is an aspiring goal. Um, and we're, we'll get there. We'll get right. there. But much mm -hmm. respect for them. So my two questions kind of still relates to what you were talking about earlier, but how did you know when you first started Burn that it would take off the way it has? And also, what do you hope for this company in the future? Yeah, thanks. So the question is, how did I know that it would take off when it started and what's the hope for the future? Well, I think the answer is that, and you guys will know this when I say it, your ambition grows as you realize success. You can get paralyzed by setting your goals too large when you don't have enough momentum. Momentum is the magic, right? So if we're able to make a promise to ourselves, keep the pro believe in the promise, right? Keep it, see the results from it, well, it reinforces that next promise we make. We see this in members too, who might continuously break promises to themselves, and it leads to self-doubt, maybe depression, in some cases suicide, like if we're being real, right? So the magic of momentum works in one way, or the opposite way, and we need to channel that and use that for growth. And so my original, my original game plan, like I don't know if you guys have seen the, uh, we don't have any of the nostalgic stuff over here, it's over at the, stu over at the studio, but it, my first goal was to have five locations in North Charlotte, and the tagline in the very first notebook when I was kind of branding it out and sketching it out was Charlotte's Fit Community of Moms. So we were super hyper-niched right away, um, and I took that, idea from my experience in baseball when I traveled and stayed with host families and helped my host moms really uh, find health and find nutrition and see how that could impact their happiness. I knew it impacted me as an athlete. It's what made me go from the college ranks to the professional ranks. I had no business doing that. I was just a harder worker than everyone else, flat out. Like nobody was willing to work as hard. I wanted it more. I was more hungry and I was willing to work hard. And so teaching my host families that kind of just by proximity and a couple people with intention. Uh, you know, it, it, it was a after the fact thing, but when I started thinking about burn, it was like, boom. And I also knew, I was also studying business for the first time and I also heard the riches are in the niches. So I was like, okay, that makes sense. Use your experience, niche yourself really deeply and go try to solve a problem in the marketplace that that uh, exists and it was that moms couldn't work out at, a, at any of the boutique studios because they didn't have child watch. That was just the first identification. So it wasn't like a mind blowing, oh, we're gonna take over the world and we're gonna dominate, we're gonna build 10,000 locations. It was, I didn't, even ha I, didn't even have an, I didn't even have an ideology at the time to have my own gyms. It was just like, let's go out and let's find five subleased spaces. There was two parking lots, uh, two gymnastic studios. Elevation Church, if you look down here, you see that church that used to be an old abandoned movie theater that a dance studio subleased, and then we sub-subleased it from the dance studio. I used to send Mike Hartshorn in there from Concord. He's our very first, franchi first franchise partner. And two days, two or three days before his very first camp there, that theater, I think it was called like the Manor Theater at something like that, it was on AMC's Most Haunted Places in America. <laughs> yes. And you know those creepy cement hallways that where the projection boxes yeah. sit? We had a projection box with the Burn Boot Camp logo on it, and he'd have to go up there and turn it on. And I remember being scared for him. He didn't know. I didn't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being scared for him every morning, you know, like going over there, clicking it on. And so, you know, that was our, that was our beginnings. And when I say success breeds ambition, we did that in three months. I thought it was going to take like a couple years. We did it in three months, and we were up and running. And then people started coming to me when we were still in the parking lot. Mike was one of them, Aaron Studdard was one of them. She's no longer the owner of South Durham, but she still works for Burn down in Trinity, Florida, I believe. Um, Aaron Studdard is her name. So those were the first two franchise partners. I started getting, that's a little bit of success, right? I'm carrying momentum forward. I made my promise in this market, fulfilled the promise in the market. People are coming to me saying, how do I bring this to Concord? How do I bring this to Durham? And so I didn't know how, so I figured out how. And they did, that gave me a little bit more momentum. And I said, you know what? Maybe we could franchise. Maybe, maybe, maybe there would be other people that would want to do this. Maybe if I put this, package this thing up and I can provide this breeding ground for like ambitious trainers to be on one team, cultivate a community, maybe there's something there. And uh, we franchised in 2015. 
my, the guy who did my documents, did the legal stuff, said, hey, Devin Morgan, you know, success would be like three locations in your first year. Well, we did 200 in 18 months, right? Right out of the gate. And it wasn't intentional. I had no idea we were gonna do that. It wasn't a goal that I set. Like so many people look at the success of what we've been able to do and think that it was like measured out the whole time. Like sometimes when you just wake up every day and you do what's right and you're not trading time for dollars and you're not worried about what you're getting but you're worried about what you're giving and that has been my mentality. After I had about 30 grand a year, that's all I needed in order for me to like live by my modest means and just save a few pennies. As soon as I had that, it wasn't about money. It was a little bit about money until that point. Right, and as soon as I got over that threshold, I didn't have kids or anything like that at the time. You know, Morgan and I were living together. She made a good salary. So as soon as I had that, it was like it no longer was about money, and that was very fast. And so I've been moving with a service attitude ever since. And then when we did that, we did 200, and I sat down with Holly after Holly was crushing it in Naples, and it was like Holly, and Justin was right there, and he and I go, we might do 500 locations, and Justin goes, yeah, right. Holly goes, <laughs> yeah, right. Morgan goes, yeah, he does that sometimes. And, these, and listen, I say that, because, and I've asked their permission to share that, because we were in a private setting, and these are the people that love me in my life the most. right? They have such good intentions for me. They, they want to see me succeed. They want to see me thrive. And there was even doubt in their head. right? And so as success grows and your ambition grows, the only way ambition isn't correlated with your success is if you let judgment get in the way. And I wasn't going to let judgment get in the way of anything. I, it was okay that they didn't. It was okay that they didn't believe in it at the time, because to me that was sufficient motivation, right? It was sufficiently motivating to say, "Hey, these people that I really care about, people I care about the most in my life, oh, they got a little doubt me too. Ooh, let's go." And it was out from love, but it was also motivating. So 500 was the goal when we got to 200. And then we got to 500. And I called Holly and Justin and I said, hey, you remember that conversation? We're going to 10,000. Do you have anything to say now? No, just, just kidding. I didn't say that. That was totally made up. No, but Holly called me and Holly said, hey, man, like, I'm ride or die with you. You already knew that, but, like, congratulations. Like, I'll believe anything you say now. Like, I know you're going to just go do it. if you." And I said, no, we did it. Together we did it because I couldn't have done it without her and, and, and you guys. And so it's all of our success to get to... We have 539 locations awarded, and we set the 10,000 goal because we know how talented and ambitious you all are. Um, you, there's trainer on trainer on trainer who've gone from this seat right now to manager to franchise partner, back to trainer. Like there's, you know, there's just a big career path here if you want to take it. And um, and and my my goal now is to dream big enough so that there's other people who have really high ambition, like that top one percent ambition that can fit their dreams inside of ours. Because if I say, hey, guys, we're going to 1,000 units um, in the country and we're already at 539, it limits the perspective of what people could accomplish in this brand immediately. It caps them, right? And so will we get to 10,000 locations, you guys? I mean, I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. I don't know. I don't know. There's probably a very small chance. I would, I would give us like a 10% chance of doing that. If we do, when we do the right things all the way along, it will happen. But we've got to do it the right way, with no major missteps, with God being on our side, with other countries grabbing on to the same thing we've grabbed on here and really embracing us. So I don't know. But um, what I do know is when we continue to wake up and serve uh, like we were in the parking lot every day in 2012, and we just keep that same attitude, we don't get fancy on success. We don't get bougie when we start making money. We don't you know, get a $100,000 salary because I'm overseeing a couple gyms, three gyms, two gyms that have 500 plus members. Now I'm overseeing 20 trainers. Like, and we get fancy on that and go buy the Gucci bag right away. It's like, if, you have, if we can keep the culture of humbleness, of pride in results, right? Pride in results, but also humility as our, as our North Star, then I think we can do it. Um, but it's gonna take, it, it, it's bigger than me at this point. And it's going to take me saying the same things over and over and over and over and over and over to, this, to different people and new people. And that's, that's all I know how to do at this point. So um, I, that's a very long-winded answer to your question. But I thought I'd give you guys just a little history so you can hear about the beginnings of Burn Boot Camp. And hopefully as I'm talking, you're paralleling your life 
and you hopefully don't need so much permission to like wake up every day and live a life of urgency with your day-to-day -day steps and servantship and servanthood and and but also patience in the long run because we want everything but we can't have everything especially right now when we want it so that's that game it's the patience and urgency game playing both sides of that and using momentum to capitalize on it we use small wins right in focus meetings that's the exact same thing we're doing for members just in the health context thanks ashley did you ask another one or was did i cover both that's how we're both. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Oh, Ooh, a little sore, a little tight. Yeah. Get it. All right. <laughs> Hello. Testing. Got me? All right. So coming from an FP standpoint, I'm currently, I don't have a gym location open yet. I'm opening one hopefully by the end of August. So I guess my question is what are the, coming from a trainer, standpoint too, what are the top three expectations you should like have to get the best trainers in your gym? So there's a, the question is, what's the best practices to onboard talent? First off, it's your standard. You have to have a standard and you have to know what you're looking for and have to be willing to say no lots of times. Because to isolate the 1%, you're going to get one out of 100 that truly can move the needle, that could sit in the room with you guys and who, in which you would be proud of. Uh, the biggest mistake I've seen franchise partners make when hiring trainers is that they get too urgent and, and, make, and make a rush um, with somebody that they very well know does not share the core values. And it's like, oh, spot to fill, uh, gotta do it, right? When in reality, what that does is undermines the standard and everybody around you, right? Because if you bring somebody on that doesn't belong, they stand out like a purple cow. And then if that purple cow happens to also be toxic and you don't do something about it, now you're the one that's toxic as the leader because you're a mirror reflection of the people that you hire. And so uh, this happened to me, I'll give you a non-contextual, no store, no names or anything. But this was years ago, right? So this isn't like anything now at HQ. This was like when we were first starting. I had a marketing person that was in the lead and they, um, were all good to me. Everything was all good to me all the time. And then everything was all bad downward, right? She was pushing down a lot of um, blame and guilt and shame and doubt to her team. And it took me a long time to recognize it. And I didn't until they started coming up to me. And they were like, had a meeting. It was like three of them at the time or four maybe. They had a meeting. They were on the brink of all walking out together because I didn't recognize that there was a leader that I had put in place that was a mirror reflection of me, and I didn't realize at the time that I was actually taking on that person's personality and the eyes of the team, because it was all good to them, right? They didn't know, so they came up to me and said, Devin, no, 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 can't do this, blah, 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 getting ready to walk out. I'm like, wow, okay, thanks for telling me. Guess what I did? Right away, right? And I actually didn't have to because I just made an address and I just said, hey, I've observed this and I've observed this. People have said this, this, and this, and I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Is this true? <laughs> and then there was a storm out and that was game over. So you don't get in that position. That's number one. Have your standard, hold the line, don't box on the ropes. You know what happens when you box on the ropes? You get beat up. Box in the middle of the ring as the franchise partner and as training managers, right? And if you are just getting open or you're a lead trainer and you want to manage people, well then do the job before you actually get the job. That's the best way to, to advance yourself. Walk it, talk it, breathe it before you actually get offered it. <coughs> Excuse me. Number two would be don't recreate the wheel and Realize that the wheel is really solid. It's, re it's a great wheel. You don't need to fix what's not broken. So there's an onboarding process that puts the strength and conditioning assessment right up front, right? Don't skip that. You know why that exists up front? Do you know why? Show them why they're the top 1% first. We hire the best. Okay, but how are we assessing what the best means? Well, if they are doing what our, we ask our members to do, or if they should be able to do 
what we ask customers to do. That's the physical nature of it, right? Correct. Okay, so that's second to the mental part of it, right? Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah, well, you should. I'm trying. It's okay. Keep trying. Are you going to keep trying? Are you going to yes. Come up and give it your very best? Yes. And that shows a bit of grit and determination. And 100%. Not even confidence. I mean, I'm not the most confident person, but like, dang it, I'm going to keep trying. And how could I ask you to keep trying? Yes. If I'm not even going to keep trying. And that's been your attitude since day one, right? Right? And the, uh, that means it's you have fortitude. Hard. Well, it's okay. Yeah, it's meant to be hard. We can do hard things, right? right. It's meant it's to be hard. hard. You know that, like, dang it, you're not there. It's okay. But you're going to keep trying. Yeah, you know? as long as you're trying. And that's what it's all that's about, what I right? Would I, and I'll be honest with you, right? Like, if, if you're going to train on my team, you've got to pass it beforehand, before you get on the floor, right? And, and listen, I don't want you to feel like I'm saying this to like isolate you or anything because there's lots of trainers that haven't passed the SAC yet in our organization, but they're trying to pass it and they've committed to it and they're actually attempting it on a regular basis. And a lot of times we do get into places as business owners when it, the stars just don't align and you've got camps to cover and we've got to onboard somebody and you have somebody with the head and the heart and they just need a little bit of time, right? And I'll give grace in those periods. But my, my team now, my team now follows the exact cadence of it, right? Because we have so many people that want to work for our gyms. That's the reason why I put the SAC up front non-negotiable is because if you got the attitude of, hey, I'm going to be on that team no matter what, you're going to go pass it. If you have the attitude of, you're making me do a physical test? Like, who does that? Like, what's it about physical nature? Like, what? I'm not, like if you have that attitude, you're projecting forward a lot of resistance to other things. You know what I mean? So follow, there's reasons behind the onboarding process. There's a reason why shadow, we missed this one in Salt Lake. I was just out in Salt Lake. We're, listen, I'm not, no one's ever going to be perfect. Like Michael Jordan didn't make 100% of his free throws, right? But he practiced like he wanted to make 100%. So the, the idea is you want to practice hard, make 100%, but are we actually going to perform at 100% all the time, you guys? No. Right, so I, I'm very transparent and vulnerable. I've got a gym out in, in, uh, in Utah, and we had a trainer who's so loyal, right, willing to pick up any camps of the week, wants to be part of the team so bad, and we had an urgent need. We had somebody leave, and then we tried to fill that need really quick, and we bypassed all of the stuff, basically, <laughs> right? I think she actually did do the SAC, but all the other stuff, like shadowing three times with your lead trainer on the floor with you in lead two before you're able to graduate to the mic on your own, that was very important. And we didn't go through those reps there. And what happened is I showed up, HQ team showed up, which brought a bunch of people. She's got 60, 70, 80 people on a pretty small floor, and she's just overwhelmed with it. Right, and it didn't set her up for success. Now she felt like a failure in that specific camp because we hadn't set her up for success and showed her what it's like to you know, train that many people or have the proper onboarding. And, and uh, so that's number two, is, is, is the steps are there for a reason. There's uh, almost 11 years now of those being baked and thousands if not hundreds of thousands of inputs and different, um, ideologies that have gone into shaping it, you know, so don't just look at the piece of paper and take it, look at that piece of paper and then imagine it has 10,000 pieces of paper behind it that are all renditions all the way up to get to the one that you're at now. And then you follow that, it's all there for a reason. Um, and then the, my third thing would be have your trainer meeting every single week religiously, do not stop it ever, <laughs> impossible. Like, show must go on and, and, and set your team up for success. Set your team up for success. Has anybody ever felt like they haven't been set up for success here in a way? Um, anybody not having trainer meetings? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nice catch, Shels. You got My it. My hands don't work very well. My feet work great. Um, 
Justin Beaverton in terms of who I hire and who I won't hire. And as a lead trainer right now, I'm responsible for that. Um, so I think that's partially me, um, but I think to my members means so much to me and the value of our gym and the value they're getting from every camp every day matters so much um, that I don't want to have to hire and fire and train and hire and fire. I'd rather train um, the best, but what was, what was I even going off of? Well, you're, you're talking about just like how, you know, you're, you're, the process is not like, you're a good example because Beaverton's growing like crazy. And, and well, we only have three trainers right now. One of them is and part even, time. And even so that you're growing, despite not having the processes yes. fully dialed in. So trainer meetings. Yes. Right. So that was my biggest thing is that I need my trainers to be on board of where their standard is. They're great, but I need them to be great. And right. I need it to be consistent. And if somebody comes in and sees us as a whole team, yep. not just me, that that will elevate even their training process and their onboarding process and doing even what Luke said of like, do all the steps from A to Z. Yes. And if you miss one, do it again. Yeah. That exactly. I think I'm like, why have we not? Cause we do the onboarding process, but not to that extent to where they shouldn't have the mic on until they can get through all of that right. without messing up. Make people earn it. Isn't it so much sweeter to do like to have the mic on your face when you've earned it? Yeah. Or like, you know, to get the trophy when you've actually earned it. You know, I'm trying to teach my kids every every sporting event they're in, they're giving them a trophy at the end of the season. And I'm like, like I'm like, dance is the best. Participation they just get one for being the there. No, yeah. not dance. In dance? Yeah, my daughter's doing dance. See, it's like platinum, dancers. platinum, double platinum, triple platinum, platinum, quadruple platinum. Everyone's platinum? No, no. <laughs> what? But then you get your overalls. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so if you don't place in the overall, yeah. like, well, why wasn't I up on stage getting, like, the banner? I'm like, you didn't, you didn't get do it. it. Nah. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Good. Good. This was my yeah, first my trophy. first dance dad season. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it feels good. The platinum, double platinum. Yeah, I'm like I'm sitting there. They're like platinum. Yeah. Double platinum. Yeah. Triple platinum. Like you the, get a platinum. I'm yeah. like. No, that's is like everyone the level. winning? <laughs> is everyone winning here? No. Uh, no. That's like what their dance score was. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. <laughs> but in general, but right? But to go yeah, off we, of that yeah. is don't. Don't miss anything. It. What yeah. they've done is literally the blueprint to success. Yeah. It's the only way you're going to succeed in your gym at all. And if you try to manipulate it, you will see the repercussions of manipulating it. And I think a lot of my heart comes from story time. Um, <laughs> Five years ago when I walked through Burns doors in Beaver 10, I was a single mom of two kids. Mm -hmm. And I was coming out of a hard time of being a single mom with two kids. Was an athlete my whole life. Didn't work out for two, three years. And I was like, I'm gonna get my, excuse me, my ass kicked in here. This is what I need, because that is how I mentally work, is by getting my ass handed to me. Um, and that's exactly what was provided for me five years ago when I was there. Long story short, became a BA. And I was like, what am I doing? Like my passion is there mm -hmm. and to really change lives and change those people's lives and empower that person that walks through the door that says, I can't do this and I don't even know why I'm here, holding their hand and telling them you can and watch yourself do it and mm -hmm. we're gonna do it together. Mm -hmm. And then letting them see that and grow from that and that's what will grow your gym. Mm -hmm. Is Susie, that was 250 pounds and walked in my door, she actually was like 232, and said, crying in the lobby, I don't know what I'm doing here, and I think I'm gonna leave. Making sure you have the trainers that will take their hand and tell them, you're not leaving, you came for a reason, and I'm gonna show you why you came. But being able to then hold Susie's hand, but run the camp. Yeah, for sure. Can I speak a little bit to that real quick? So when these processes weren't, it's evolved over the last you eight years. You can be honest and say all the things you want okay. to say. I'm not offended, I get it, we had to come up, I get it. It's evolved over the last eight years and as I was not given, the, the training wasn't there, the onboarding process wasn't there when I was on, uh, when I was onboarded and it is now the last two trainers that I, on, I onboarded them together in December. So they've been training what, seven months, six months, something like that. They are, 
light years ahead of what I was even three years in because we followed that process. And that's what you, we were talking about earlier. Our, every single trainer in my gym is hard because of that onboarding process. Like, was I hard three years in? Probably not. Am I hard now? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm um, but those, <laughs> those, those newer trainers that we have are just as hard and people don't walk in and they're like, oh, it's Jordan, it's not Sam. They're like, crap, it's Jordan. Right. I'm gonna get my ass kicked today, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I just wanna speak to that. Like, yeah. I can tell you firsthand that what, what is there is good. Yeah. So um, as you continue to grow, and go into the business, especially as like a like a lead trainer. What is the most effective way to self evaluate? Because my biggest thing is I don't want to get complacent. Mm -hmm. And you're continuing to train, you know, other trainers coming in, but then who's training you? How do you self evaluate yourself to be the most effective trainer and not be in a place of, um, you know, complacency? Yeah, that's a great question. So how do you create how do you create the feedback a, a cycle of feedback for yourself? I think the answer is to seek it. If you're seeking it and you go seek it from other people, trainers, members, VA, like, and, but you, the, here's the caveat. You actually have to want to know the answer, right? You actually have to be looking for the gap. We know the growth is in the gap, right? And you know that or else you wouldn't ask the question. To me, to me, it, um, actions, we all heard this, actions are louder than words. So saying that I'm humble, saying that I want to get better, saying that I want feedback means like two cents. But actually doing it, seeking it, going after it. If you watch her and her bees here train and I'm in camp, guys, there's like less than 13 seconds before camp's over and they're like, D DK, can you do feedback loop with me? I'm hungry. Like relentlessly and I'm this, but I was always the same way with them. And so getting better is about using, I think about it this way, right? You should probably, it's, it's, the, it's, the two in, it's the two in many model. So in my life, the only reason I've been able to grow is because of I, I look at everyone as my mentor. There's two people and the combination of two people that do am really ambitious things in whatever realm of the world that you want to do ambitious things, pick out two people, right? And then yourself is the third one and learn everything about them that you like and download that and mix it in with your personality, okay? That's like 80% of the battle. The other 20% is sharpening that sword. That means everyone else is your mentor. The many are your mentor. And if you're just asking, I mean, I've had mentors on flights that I'm sitting next to that I didn't want to talk to this person. Like I was just trying to keep AirPods in, get some work done. They strike up a conversation. They're super interesting. And then I start asking them questions and questions and questions. Like I met a guy at the airport the other day who I bumped out of first class because I changed my flight and I got a lot of points. So I bumped him out and they upgraded me. I was like, yes. And he knows Matt Flynn. If you know Matt, if you know Matt Flynn, he's an eight year NFL quarterback. And I'm talking to Matt Flynn next week on the phone. Right, and it was because I was curious about everyone I'm around all the time, open-hearted at not closing off conversations, thinking that, believing that I could grow from a conversation that if you and I talked, I would be so curious to understand what you have inside of your head that could be golden to me that I, that I don't know yet. Because there's something all of you can add to each of us like in a 30 second conversation if we ask the right questions and you could empower me and you could teach me things. So every, if you have the two and many model, two mentors and then many is everyone, and you're, cu and you're curious, and you're genuinely curious, meaning you wanna know the answer, that's the, that's, that's the formula to self-awareness. Gotcha. Now, self-awareness is just knowledge. Having self-awareness is knowledge. Knowing your gaps is knowledge. Knowledge is not power. You heard like knowledge is power before? Mm -hmm. Knowledge is potential power. It's power in the queue. <laughs> you still gotta, go take action against it. And what those people um, help you identify as a gap for you, put it down on paper, make it real, make it a goal, and go attack it, you know? And, and that's been my formula. And your ability to attack your gaps is, your, is just gonna pace your growth. That's how fast you'll grow, is how fast you can find your gaps, and then how quickly you can attack them. And layer in a little, strategy in with that and all of a sudden you start closing multiple gaps with a few decisions or strategies so okay. is that helpful yeah thank you yeah do you think about it that way uh yes okay absolutely all right good curiosity number one trait of leadership is curiosity if you're curious everybody and that's that culture of feedback talking about the feedback loop there's two things it's real-time feedback have you guys learned that this week 
done some sessions on real-time feedback. So powerful, so powerful. That and the feedback loop, those two things that Luke and team is teaching you all, uh, seek those two things in the gym and your culture of awareness, your culture of growth is in the gaps, your culture of crushing members. Like, you know, like you don't want people walking off the floor very easily after a workout, right? You want them to struggle a little bit. And that culture is only manifest by the leader in the gym asking others for their input. Yeah, good question. We got time for, is it time for me? What time is it? Am I five minutes over? Who, who is that appointment? Oh, okay. Okay, we'll do one more. Oh, we'll, do, we'll do one more, please. One more, one more. Mine's one more. more of a comment, so if someone no, you has can do a it. question, yeah. it's okay. Any, li any like pressing questions that you guys wanted to ask before a comment? Yes, please. Well, yeah, go ahead. I got, I got, I got when Leslie up? tells me five, that usually means like seven. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> she knows. She builds it in. It's really ten, but it's five, so we're good. <laughs> yeah. Will we get a feedback loop? Yeah, yeah, we, we will. Yeah, we will. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm very impressed by the Burn brand. Um, my first workout at Burn was mid-December oh, wow. last year. Yes. Um, Welcome. I've, um, I worked and have been a group fitness instructor with Les Mills for 12 years. Um, I worked for their Middle East you office. You work for Thomas and Jojo, don't you? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they but, texted me. Oh, they told they? me, yes, I'm glad to meet you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but I even, I'm just so impressed. The culture is just, and I don't know if you know much about Les Mills. I do, it not is, about the culture, but about the products. It's, you know, like a cult, because it's people love it and they live it and breathe it. And I can feel that with burn and, but I think it's even more impactful. And um, since I've been here, I actually made the choice to drop all my, Les Mills classes, which was a, it was just like you mentioned with, you know, dropping your camps or leaving baseball. It's like, it's been part of my life for a long time, mm -hmm. but burn is, it's just like, I can feel it. I can feel it. And it's the culture, like, as soon as you walk in the door, it's like something else. So, I don't know. Hey, that's action right <laughs> there. Yeah. Let's go. Welcome. So, that's a, action. I yeah. love that. So, thank you for sharing. Thank that's you for all. sharing. So, um, and I also, second comment, you would be super successful if you found a franchise partner in Dubai. Like, this would, this would take off. That's, I lived there for five and a half years. It would be, like, without a doubt. Yeah. I, I may or may not have had a meeting it is very with tempting, a Dubai but development company this morning. Oh. Yeah. Oh. You did? Today? Her name, yeah, her name is Venus, Brand Global. Yeah. Listen, um, I'm the visionary. Listen, I'm the visionary, though. I'm the visionary. My job is to set up the future. So I'm fully focused on your locations, unit level economics, getting all of our, we got to all get to 500 members. Like that, when we, get, I'm not focused on getting bigger. I'm focused on getting better. And when we get better, we'll get bigger as a byproduct of that. And when we continue to think inside out, hyper local, thinking small to get big, that's the mentality but I know that's gonna work, and so I need to anticipate the future and make connections in that world now, so that the time when it comes, mm -hmm. they're already gonna know. Yeah. They're already gonna know. So that's just ironic that, that you, yeah. that you oh. said that, for sure. I, well, I, I worked with gyms all over the Middle East, and like, was at the fitness expos and everything for so many years, and so it's like, I know, I, I know it would work. I know, like, Ladies only. Get All right, I'm gonna ask yeah. Thomas and Jojo if you yeah. can come with me I know, right? in 25 when I fly I'll, I'll over there. I'll get it. I'll set you up. <laughs> I, know, I know some uh, like royal family connections. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good. Yeah. Hopefully they didn't own less mills. Yeah. No, you, no, no, no. You're no. Out. It's all good. Thank you for that. Yeah. It means a lot. Okay. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you guys for spending some time with me. Uh, I truly enjoy this time more than anything else. With, I have another session with FPs later, and between just being able to hang and, and talk shop, and hopefully you get a little bit of my heart for this. I never have a script coming in, um, but I always wanna make sure that you felt, that you feel my love for you, that you feel my love for the brand, 
and hopefully you, in between that you see that our core values aren't just stickers on our computers and that you see that we actually live by people first as the most important one, pride in results is the, most, as the second most important one. Authenticity and integrity are built into who we are and who we are is much more important than what we do. And if you remember that, and who are, we're becoming is much more important than what we're getting. It's a good philosophy to, uh, to have impact on. And so I appreciate all the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into this. I know you're up when the sun's not. I know some, some of you uh, are in the gym till the sun goes down. And this lifestyle is one we choose, but it's also a hard thing. And you know, when we do the hard things, life gets easier. When we do the easy things, life gets hard, right? So just keep, keep at it. Keep going. There's, these, one, there's one person in your community that every time we have doubt, every time we have go inward, every time it's, yeah, just think about that person, right? That one person that you know you've saved their life. I know each of you have had that scenario. I know because I've heard it from your, your members. They've come up to me and tell me, the gym, Sam, Ashley, McKenna, changed my life. Not only changed my life, but saved it. I've had multiple people pull up their sleeves and show me. There's one lady that had multiple scars here. And then right before the last one, instead of getting a scar, she got a burn boot camp tattoo. Instead of trying to do it again, she got a burn tattoo. The most powerful thing I've ever seen. I was weeping. <laughs> You know, and these are, these are real stories. There's no hyperbole. I'm not blowing smoke. There's people listening to this that are gonna be like, yeah, that was me. And uh, it's incredibly sad how people don't get the encouragement that they deserve in the four walls of their household. And it's a privilege that we get to be the ones that are their source of positive light, optimism, and cultivating an attitude of greatness and allowing them to be, inviting them in to be a part of a championship culture. And that's who we are, that's what we do. We're the best to do it, damn it. We're the best to do it. And, we're, and, and I'm not getting complacent, and I hope that you don't either, because we're gonna keep getting better and keep getting better and keep getting better, because it's about them. It's about being there for them, right? Two claps on two, one, two, awesome.